Hi everyone, it's Josh, and we can officially kick off the holidays with the annual release of our Star Wars Holiday Special episode. I hope by now it's become an annual tradition in your home rather than a deepening annoyance, and I hope it brings you glad tidings rather than rage listening. I know some of you have been at it since September, but let the 2023 holidays begin. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark with Charles W. Chuckers Bryant and Jerry Jerome Rowland. Uh, the the Wookiee mother. Yeah, <laughs> Mala. Uh, that was the Wookiee wife. Oh, and mother. Yeah, sure. Chewbacca's mom is not with them any longer. Yeah. She left. Yeah. She was not about to appear in that. <laughs> she went out the window. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm excited about this, I have to say. Uh, we should say happy Star Wars Day. Yeah, today is um, December 17th. Um, I have my opening night tickets. Do you really? Sure. Wow. You don't? I Do you no. care? Are you into it? Uh, yeah, I will, I will definitely go see it in the theater, but okay. um, I, well, I won't be there opening night. Sure. I've gotten really adept at like ignoring spoilers, people talking about yeah. stuff, all that. Like, so I can I could conceivably see this movie a month after it comes out, and it's and, all good, and still going fresh. Yeah, that's good. I'm an ostrich. Yeah, you you black yourself out. Yeah, you go dark. I, <laughs> I do. <laughs> I make myself go to sleep. Basically, you go to the dark side. I've been there. A while now. Uh, well, happy Star Wars Day, though. I'm sure that I think this pairs nicely with Christmas, Star Wars Day. It's all come together. Yes. Um, we already missed Life Day, though. So happy belated <laughs> Life Day, Chuck. Are they celebrating it this year? November 17th. Yeah, but it's every three years. Mm. Arcane. <laughs> yeah. Man, <laughs> so nice weird. job. Okay, so it's every three years. Started in 1978. Let's do the math, shall we? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Quick math break. I believe that 2014 was the last life day. Man, we just missed it. And then again in 2017. Okay, so 2017, <laughs> we'll celebrate life day. We'll put on our red robes, uh-huh. uh, our ultra-long, straight, ironed wigs. Sure. And we'll celebrate life day the way it was meant to Yes, be. and if you have no idea what we're talking about, we are talking about <laughs> life day, which is... A celebration uh, that Wookiees in the Star Wars universe have yep. every three years. Yeah, it's like their Christmas. Yeah, they or celebrate. Or their Hanukkah, uh, or their Kwanzaa, <laughs> or their Tet. Supposedly, it's sort of like Earth Day, too. They celebrate the diversity of their ecosystem uh, and also remembrance of the dead. And they also give so they're, gifts. They're like the Finns, basically. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very interesting part of the Star Wars canon. It is, and it's almost entirely made up. Dashed off, you could possibly say, by um, George Lucas in the 70s. Yeah. Um, and it, it's the basis of what has become derided as, like, one of the worst things that ever happened to the Star Wars galaxy. Well, not only that, one of the worst things ever aired on television. Yeah, which, in this galaxy. Yeah. At first, that sounds like hyperbole, like, come on, it's because it was Star Wars and we had high expectations. But it's really that bad. Yeah, the people who say that haven't seen even a second of it. Yeah. Yeah. However, I watched it uh, when I was a kid. Uh Uh-huh. Then again this week. Yeah. And you watched it twice this week. Yeah, I watched it last night and this morning. There's something about it. It's mesmerizing. It really is. It's one of those things (laughs) that you start watching it and you want to turn it off, but you want to see just how absurd it can get almost. Uh, yeah, and it starts absurd. It stays absurd in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> it's increasingly more absurd. It gets a little less absurd, finishes super absurd. Yeah, it's a, just a train wreck in every <clears throat> single sense of the word, top yeah. to bottom. It's extraordinarily difficult to overstate how bad this is. Yeah. And some people, I've, you know, in researching this, you read about it, you read descriptions of these things, and it, it it just can't possibly be gotten across until you see it. So, luckily, as we will see, you can go onto YouTube mm-hmm. and watch it. And you may even enjoy this episode more if you pause, go spend two hours yeah. watching this thing, <laughs> yeah. and then come back and laugh along with us. Yeah, there's a great... Uh, over the years, there have been uh, many segments of it on YouTube from badly dubbed VHS tapes. Yeah, But uh, there is one really pretty good version of it in full... Um, 
Uh, brought to you by WHIO, Dayton, Ohio, Channel 7. Woo, Ohio. Because <laughs> that flashes up on the screen periodically. Yeah. Um, Man, it is high quality. Yeah, it looks good. It has to basically be the copy that the actual um, affiliate broadcast. Yeah. It's like that that quality. Compared to the other stuff floating around on sure. YouTube, it's clearly recorded on a 1978 VCR. Yeah, which, which were, were really expensive. Very expensive. I did some calculating on West Egg. Okay. Um, so the average VCR went for about $1,000. They were brand new. That's amazing. $1,000 in 1978 money. So they were about $3,800 in 2014 money. Crazy. Luckily, there were some rich people out there recording this stuff. Yeah. And the wealthy have saved us all again. Yes. Yet again, as they always do. Yes. Uh, we need to shout out some articles that we uh, use for this. There's great... A great article in Vanity Fair called The Han Solo Comedy Hour, <laughs> exclamation point, yes. by uh, Frank DiGiacomo. And then there's uh, the, uh, the Star Wars Holiday Special was the worst thing on television ever by someone we kind of know, Alex Pasternak. Of, yeah, uh, from Motherboard. Yeah, which is uh, not Wired, it's uh, Vice. Vice. Yes. Yeah, we wrote Vice. a little bit for Motherboard back then, and we had a call with Alex. We're like, we're like old Motherboard vets, Yeah, basically. And wasn't there one more? There was another one, and I don't know who wrote this one, Chuck. Uh, yeah. It's the, the title's The Star Wars Holiday Special George Lucas Wants to Smash Every Copy of with a Sledgehammer. <laughs> which is a famous quote, uh, supposedly at a convention by Lucas. Yes, which is not correct. He didn't ever say that? No. Okay, that, that sounded like something that people made up. Yes, but if you go on the internet, you will quickly believe that he did, but sure. apparently didn't. So let's, I'm let's, sure he felt that way, though. It clearly, you know, because he did appear on Robot Chicken in I think 2005 on the therapist couch talking about how much he hated <laughs> the special. All right, so let's set the background, shall we? Shall we go back to 1977? Yeah, summer. Get, get in the old wayback machine. All right, let's do it. All right, here we are. There's Wooderson. Yeah, I'm just a little six year old excited about Star Wars. I am, uh, I've just turned one. Yeah, so you don't know what's up yet. I, please forgive me if I urinate myself. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Uh, so what has happened is Star Wars has become a huge, huge hit, seemingly out of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, establishing George Lucas as one of the brilliant young minds in filmmaking. Uh, even though it wasn't his first movie, it was his first huge, huge breakout hit. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Talk, I mean, talk about a breakout hit. Like, no one had ever seen anything like it before. No. 2001 had come out in the late 60s. Yeah. But it wasn't... It, it's Different still, kind of movie. It still isn't accessible to all audiences, you know? It's yeah, a, it's, it's pretty not a... cerebral film. Yeah, it's not an adventure movie. This was, like yeah. Wars. This is, like, basically swashbuckling on the screen, but, uh, you know, in a galaxy far, far away. Star Wars just changed everything, and it came on just like a, a hammer. Yeah. Um, this and, is a new hope, by the way. Yes. And I know we're going to get stuff wrong, nerds, so yes. just... Just go ahead and get your little fingers ready to email us. Uh, like, if it wasn't driven home that I'm not a nerd by the <laughs> fact that I don't have opening night tickets or yeah. any tickets yet, give me a break. Okay. And by proxy Chuck, too, okay? Yes, thank you. So, um, it, it's it's hard to state how great Star Wars was in everyone's mind. Yeah. Right? Bill Murray came out with that lounge singer Star Wars thing. Yeah, it was everywhere. And if you if you just listen to the lyrics of it... He's really, it's just Bill Murray singing about how much Star Wars is awesome. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So by the following year, um, George Lucas was, he wanted to figure out a way to keep audiences just engaged with the whole Star Wars franchise that he was just starting to build. But he knew that Empire Strikes Back was a couple more years out. Sure. So um, he, I think he was approached by some TV executives who said, have you considered doing some sort of, TV special. They're all the rage right now. We have a, a we have a graphic that's really awesome that we set aside just for TV specials here at CBS. Why don't you let us, let's get together and do a Star Wars special. That's right. Producers Gary Smith and uh, Dwight Hemion uh, were working over at CBS, and they say this is a great way to keep the spirit alive while you're making your other movie, mm -hmm. maybe move some more toys. Yeah, which George Lucas got a cut of all the toys. Sure. So sure. Uh, it was right before Thanksgiving, and he said there would be a lot of people watching TV. Um, 
pre-holiday season, or I guess in the holiday season. Well, the weekend before Thanksgiving, it's like everybody's yeah. shopping, sitting around with family, like waiting to actually do stuff. That's right. It's perfect time to broadcast something on TV. So Lucas says, all right, let's do this. Uh, I don't have a ton of time, but how about this? I'll get I'll get a story together, and then you can go hire a whiz bang team of of veteran writers and producers and directors. Whatever genre you think is appropriate, <laughs> yeah. and those are the words that will haunt John, George Lucas <laughs> to his grave. Yeah. So uh, Lucas said, uh, "Here's my idea. I want it to be based um, on Wookies, and I want it to take place on their home planet of uh, Kizuk." Or Wookiee Planet C. Is that or, how you say it? Kazook? That's how it's pronounced in the episode, the holiday special, but it's also pronounced different ways other times. I would have pronounced it Kashi E E. Go spell it K A S H Y Y Y K. Yeah. Which, I mean, I guess that sounds like Chewbacca's planet. Sure. Uh, also called G5623, Wookiee Planet C, or Edeon. Is a mid rim planet. Right. So the whole reason, apparently, that George Lucas was interested in featuring the Wookiees was it is what we in show business call low hanging fruit. The reason why it was low hanging fruit was because they had just established the different scenes that would make the cut for Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. And uh, what, how did you pronounce it again? Kazook. Kazook had not made the cut. Uh, even prior to this, apparently for A New Hope, George Lucas had whipped up a 40-page, what's known as the Wookiee Bible. Yeah. It's like a 40-page supplement that's all about Kazook and Wookiees and Chewbacca and his family and everything about wookie right? That's right. So he's like, I've got this thing already you know, established. I love Wookiees. Um, they didn't make the cut. I'm a little sad about that. They're not going to, Kazook is not going to show up in Empire Strikes Back. Let's, let's build the entire special around Wookiees. It's basically the one demand me, George Lucas, has. Yeah. That's it. I'll be totally hands off from this point on. <laughs> Which he kind of was. He, he totally was. Yeah. And it was actually this experience that apparently taught him to Tonight. be the very <laughs> hands on person that he is famous for being. It yeah. came out of this Christmas special. Absolutely. He, he was burned and, um, <laughs> he was had an iron grip after that yeah. on everything. So uh, here's some, some of the folks behind it. Uh, Bruce Valanche, famous uh, TV writer. You've probably seen him on Hollywood Squares. Wasn't he suspected of being Thomas Pinchon for a while? Oh, I don't know. Or was Thomas Pinchon on Hollywood Squares? I have no idea. I, I may be confabulating some stuff, confounding. Yeah. There's some con of some sort going on. <laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. So uh, Valanche was hired as a writer. Uh, a guy named uh, Lenny Rips was hired as a writer. Who has some great quotes in that Vanity Fair article. He does. Uh, his first quote was, we were really excited because this is Star Wars. How could it lose? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Famous last words. Uh, who else was hired? There was uh, a, a husband and wife team, uh, the Welches. Yeah. Who are the parents of, of folk singer Gillian Welch, mm -hmm. who I'm a big fan of, yeah. and I had no idea that her parents, they were producers slash songwriters of the day. They were big on the variety show scene, which would turn out to be a, a really key uh, cog in this whole experience. So I feel like uh, right about here, Jerry should insert a um, needle coming off of a record sound effect. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks, Jerry. So Chuck, you just said singer-songwriters. Yeah. What would that have to do with Star Wars? <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, in this Star Wars holiday special, for those of you who hadn't seen it, there are musical numbers. They decided from the outset that there should be musical numbers. And the reason that they decided that there should be musical numbers is because the people who sold George Lucas, and at the time it was um, Star the Star Wars Corporation was what it was called, Yeah. Um, on the idea of doing this TV special was that Everyone would love a variety show. Yeah, it was the 70s. Great idea. Let's do a variety show. The problem was this. Apparently, George Lucas didn't watch enough TV. Yeah. And he also overly trusted people who talked to him. Sure. Because by 1978, yes, variety shows had dominated television for w over 10 years. But it had come to an end. It was getting stale. Yeah, we're was, talking uh, Carol Burnett show, one yeah, of my favorites. Had just been canceled after 11 seasons. Uh, yep. Uh, That's a big red flag. Sonny and Cher had just had its last season. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, what else? Like, Hee Haw was, Hee Haw was still going on. Probably. They didn't know when I to quit. I think Hee Haw's still on. <laughs> is Solid it? Gold had yet to come on and take up the mantle. That, that wasn't a variety show. That was a little bit. 
Uh, there was talking in between the songs. Yeah, remember the Mandrell Sisters show? Barbara I never Man. watched that one. What yeah. was with that country chic thing that happened? It was, yeah, it was a big deal in the you 70s. Know? It's kind of happening again, I think. Oh, because of that dude. The guy who won all the CMA awards. Uh, I don't know. He's like, he's he came along and he's like actually country. His dad's like a coal miner for real from Kentucky. I think I know who you mean. Chris, uh, Chris what's something. his face? Yeah. Yeah, he's, he is good. He's come along and been like, what are you guys doing? Well, there's a revival in like good country music again. That's great. Like in the tradition of Merle Haggard and Johnny sure. Cash. And I guess it's probably where the country sheet came from because there was actually good country going on. Yeah, Johnny Cash had a variety show. Did he really? Oh, yeah. I knew they did like a, a Sunday singing thing. Like out in Virginia. Yeah, he had his own variety show. It was actually pretty good. There were some like really great performances. <laughs> Do you know how many nerds are like, get back to Star Wars? <laughs> I know. I'm so sorry. All right. So the variety show is is dying sort of. And so they figure what a great time to take the biggest movie property on the planet and, and wedge it into the variety <laughs> show uh, milieu. I don't know if wedge is the right word. I think maybe uh, nestle it in there. Yeah. And then start hitting it with the blunt edge of an axe until it mashes into that crevice. You know? That's right. Because this is the time when Fantasy Island had just started. Um, uh, Mork and Mindy was about to change things. Charlie's Angels was getting huge. It basically, television as we knew it from 1980 to whenever the real world came along. Yeah. Just escapist television is what they sure. called it, was was starting, and it was the hip new thing. So basically, if they had turned Han Solo and Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker into maybe, you know, sexy detectives, it might have gone over even better. But they went the other way. They decided to latch on to this extraordinarily stale um, genre of television, and they hired the best in the business. Yeah. Like, there was, there was, there was a quote from, I think, Lenny Rips, who was saying, like, we had... Literally a dream team, yeah. a variety show dream team, mm-hmm. and everybody was good, but there were probably no bad welders on the Titanic <laughs> yeah, either. That's a great quote. Yeah. Uh, the guy they hired to direct it initially was a, a dude named David Akomba, and uh, he had made his name uh, for Welcome to the Fillmore East. It was a concert documentary with Van Morrison, uh, Van Morrison and the Birds in 1971, and he actually was at USC Film School the same time as Lucas, even though they didn't know each other. And um, he only ended up directing about three segments of the thing. Before he quit. Yep, before he walked off. Some say he was actually let go. Uh, but we'll get to him in a minute and who replaced him Okay. Uh, as, as we get along down this uh, gross road. Well, let's, let's take a little break because I'm, I'm overly excited. All right. Okay. All right, so we've established most of the main players. We'll we'll get to a few more. Mm-hmm. Uh, we should point out that um, Mark Hamill and and Harrison Ford and uh, Carrie Fisher, sure, uh, Peter Mayhew, they had no grounds to refuse to be on this. Basically, <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much. They were not huge, huge stars yet. They could throw their weight around and say, "This is terrible," and I'm not doing it. They were they were big overnight because of Star Wars for sure, but they weren't. To the adoring public. Sure. Back at the studio, they could still be bossed around, and, and yeah. this was the result of it. And you can tell also, um, just from watching the actual special, it, like oh, Harrison Ford is not happy to be there at any point. Oh, no. Um, Princess Leia is clearly on drugs. Uh, was she on drugs at this point? Uh, she, uh, If you watch it, she's, okay. <laughs> she's on drugs, especially the ending scene. Mark Hamill... Uh, it was, looks like he's happy to be there, actually. He was fine, but apparently he said, no, I'm I'm not doing a musical number. Yeah. And if you watch his part, wedging a musical number in there would have been even more painful. Sure. Um, but they, they everybody who was part of the actual Star Wars franchise that wasn't wearing like a full body costume yeah. was like, I'm, I really wish I wasn't here. And you can tell. Too. Oh, yeah. In fact, in the uh, opening uh, credit sequence, they're showing... The picture, the you know, the faces of the people, right. and uh, you see Harrison Ford as if he's flying the Millennium Falcon, and you can 
You can just hear the guy off screen going, now look at the camera and just give a nod. Just look at the camera and give a nod. Right. And he finally, you can tell he's pissed off, and he looks up at the camera and just sort of smirks. Yeah, and points at the camera like, okay, I'm looking at the camera, <laughs> yeah. and then goes back to what he's doing. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. I felt bad for him. So early on, uh, Valanche and others did kinda... you Did you feel bad for him, though, really? Yeah. I mean, like, come on. It's Harrison Ford. It's Han Solo. He has to go do this for, like, five days. Yeah, I felt I, terrible I, for him. <laughs> I think it's hilarious that they had to do this, especially now. Well, early on, uh, Valanche and others knew that they may be in trouble because uh, they decided not to subtitle any of the Wookiee dialogue. Right. And they literally started after a brief opening scene setting it up. Here, here's the basic plot is Han Solo is trying to get Chewbacca back to Kazook in time for Life Day so he can celebrate with his family. That's the basis of the entire two hours. That's the basis of the entire two hours. They encounter a, a space battle, and they're delayed. And the next two hours are kind of what's going on while the delay is happening. Back on Kazook. Back on Kazook. Because you hear, like, oh, okay, well, Han Solo and Chewbacca evading the Imperial Guard and all that stuff for two hours. I would watch that. Sure. I would, too. Yeah. That's not what they show. Killing time at the Wookiee household. <laughs> that is what they show. Yeah. That's what they do. It's people hanging out, waiting for Chewbacca, worrying about him. Yeah. And then killing time while they wait for him to come back. Yeah, literally. So, um, and so hold on. So you say there's a setup, right? Yeah, that's the initial setup. And then, Chuck, that's followed by this. Yeah, it's followed by literally 10 minutes, 10 solid minutes of incomprehensible Wookiee speak. So let's let's join it for a second, shall we? Yeah. Let's all enjoy it. And again, you yeah. said 10 minutes, and you're not exaggerating. You're not being hyperbolic. Yeah. You can time it. That's, it's 10 minutes of Wookiees talking to each other with no subtitles. Fortunately— I couldn't follow it at first. I, like, I didn't even know who it was. I thought it was might have been Chewbacca's mom and dad. Oh, yeah, that's And possible. little brother. Sure. And I don't find out until later when Mark Hamill shows up via uh, Skype call yeah. and says— he really explains everything that had just happened. <laughs> like, you're Chewbacca's father, right. Itchy. You're Chewbacca's son, uh, Lumpy. Lumpy. Yeah. And you are Chewbacca's wife. Oh, Mala. Yeah, thank you. So before everybody starts, like, freaking out, we know that that's actually their nicknames. Their real names are, his father is uh, Atichik Cook. Atichik Cook. It's really hard to pronounce. Mulatto Buck is his wife, and his son is... Lumpo Warump. <laughs> but as named by Lucas. But yeah, but Lucas also named him Lumpy, Itchy, and Mala. Yeah. So um, they're all back there wringing their hands, trying to figure out ways to pass the time uh, until they get word from Chewbacca that he's made it to uh, what is it, Ketchup? Kazook. Kazook. Um, Did you say ketchup? Ketchup. Or catsup <laughs> if you're fancy. Yeah. Um, but Chewbacca is having trouble getting back to uh, Kachuk because there's Kazuk. <laughs> because there's a, a blockade by the Empire, yes. and they're looking for rebels, specifically Chewbacca, who I didn't realize this. He's the most famous Wookiee of all. Did you know that? Yeah, of course. I didn't know that. Well, I mean, he's the only one that really appears in the movies. Or, well, I mean, yeah, to that degree. Yeah, but we're seeing, like, you know, these people's view of the sure. universe. What about back on... Kazook, yeah, he, he might have just been a fly-by-night Wookiee. Right. Yeah, but not the case. Very famous Wookiee. Yeah, and he really loved to, like, soak in his fame. All right, so he realizes there's a problem, Valanche. He goes to Lucas and is like, I don't know, man. Uh, this is your world, but it may not be the strongest thing to do to set this in Wookiee land and have all this incomprehensible dialogue 
and he says he was met with a glacial stare. Uh, well, and then... he, he put it a little differently <laughs> than that. Well, he said glacial stare. He did. The glacial stare that he got was for this quote. He said, these people just talk in what sounds like fat people having an orgasm. <laughs> yeah. He goes, if you want, you can set up a tape recorder in my bedroom, and I'll do all of the foleying it for it. Yeah, he's a large guy. He is. So uh, that's what got the glacial stare. But Valanche later said that from this, there was one development meeting that Lucas attended, and it was, here's the Wookiee Bible. Shh, tell me what you got. And it, Valanche said he and the other writers and producers and director were just kind of throwing ideas and – George Lucas would either say, like, no, that doesn't work, give him a glacial stare, or say, yes, that's exactly it. Yes, let's make this a variety show. Yeah, and there was a little bit of um, background there. The the cantina players in the band <clears throat> had appeared on other variety shows at that point. Yeah. And I think it went over fairly well just as a short segment on, like, the Richard Pryor uh, variety show or uh, Donnie Marie. Yeah. Um, man, there were a lot of variety shows. The, but that's what I'm saying. It was that was television. That's what you did. Like the Brady's, yeah. um, the 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 show had its course, and then it became a variety show. It was just everybody loved variety shows. Yeah, I by, still do. By this time, though, everybody was sick of variety shows. Right, and so it, it really was a, a terrible choice. In fact, they even hired a couple <clears> of writers <throat> from uh, Shields and Yarnell. which I hadn't heard of. Had you? Oh yeah, I watched it. It was uh, these that? creepy this mime couple. Who had their own <laughs> yeah. variety show, and uh, they figured these two will be great because they are used to working without words. Right. So, and so there is a certain logic to the variety show. It's not logic just that, all over the place. It's not just that variety shows were popular. Yeah. At the time, it, it somebody was like, "Well, Wookies, you don't understand what they're saying. So this is all going to be very physical." So these people who who did what is it Shields and Yarnell? Yeah. Uh, that that's a perfect choice. That that makes complete sense. You can see this whole this whole process of leading up to the point where it was produced and shot and everything. Yeah. A, a series of like, oh, we have this problem. Well, here's a fix. Yeah. Well, but that leads to another problem. Well, we'll fix it with this. And and no one's stepping back and being like, all we've done is create a series of problems that are going to come together and make one extraordinarily large problem that will become legendary. No one did that, and so the whole thing was was made. That's right, and it uh, eventually airs on... Uh, November 17th, 1978, a Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. That's right, and uh, according to uh, Nielsen ratings, it um, attracted 13 million viewers, uh, just, lost the second hour... Just in the U.S. It aired in six or seven countries total. Yeah, but... No one cares about that. I guess not, because none of those are on the internet, you know? Uh, it, it finished second to The Love Boat in the second, or I'm sorry, from eight to nine. And then the next hour actually finished behind part two of a miniseries about Pearl Harbor starring Angie Dickinson. So yeah. it didn't even win their respective hours. No, 13 million, that's, that's not bad. Eh. The thing is, apparently, if you look at the Nielsen ratings graph... For the first hour? Yeah, we know about that graph. It's okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we do. And then after a, a very important part, which we'll talk about soon, um, it just drops off at the end of the first hour. And that actually probably made the executives at CBS cringe for a number of reasons. Number one is this special was originally supposed to just be an hour, but so many advertisers wanted to sign on yeah. that they extended it to two hours oh, you and can tell. it shines through. You can totally tell that this thing was never supposed to be. I think an hour might have been stretching it, to tell you the truth. Oh, yeah. It's 30 minutes of content, 40 if you're generous, an hour, meh, and then two hours, it becomes one of the worst things that was ever put on television. All right, well, let's take a break, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the actual, um, uh, I even don't want to call it content. <laughs> <laughs> but it is content in the strictest definition. Sure. Right after this. All right, so the show itself, we've given you the, the main plot line, uh, which, again, is that Chewie is trying to get back to his home planet mm -hmm. to celebrate Life Day with his family. Right. That's it. And, again, we almost barely see Chewie. Yeah. 
The rest is <laughs> his family on Kazook waiting for him to come back for Life Day. Yeah, so um, some of the various things they did, uh, there were guest stars. There was uh, Harvey Corman from The Carol Burnett Show. Okay. One of my all-time favorites. Him or Carol, Bur- Carol Burnett Show? Both. He's great. Yeah. He actually, if you watch what he's doing, you're like, this he's guy's trying. a comedy genius for well, sure. Well, uh, apparently he too was like the only one on set that was bringing levity. He was joking around and kind of kept spirits up. Good for him. That's what I say. And, and he had three different, three different parts. Yeah, he played... Uh, uh, well, I don't even know the names. Actually, we could look them up. But he played a uh, he played a Julia Child like cook. There's an actual cooking segment, a long one, a very long cooking segment where uh, Chewbacca's wife um, makes bantha stew to kill some time. To kill some time, uh, both, because they're both just waiting on her planet and <laughs> in our living room. Yeah. So Harvey Corman is in drag as a four armed Julia Child like. Uh, TV chef. Right. Uh, I think it's Gormanda is her name. Gormanda, that makes total sense. Yeah. Uh, he also plays, um, there's this one weird bit where Chewbacca's son tries to figure out a way to trick the stormtroopers. The, the Empire had come and kind of, because of the blockade, raided the house and other properties. Mm-hmm. So he tries to trick them uh, by, I think, rigging a comm link mm-hmm. uh, to speak in a, a different voice. So right. he has to watch the instruction manual. He watches an instruction video. <laughs> Which was Harvey Keitel as a robot. It, oh, it would have been wonderful to be Harvey Keitel. <laughs> oh, what did I say? Harvey Keitel? Harvey Corman. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Harvey Keitel <laughs> murders someone in the middle of the instruction that would have been great. Video. <laughs> Harvey Corman. And then the final role he had was as a, uh, a bar patron in the cantina uh, that drinks. He has a hole in the top of his head like a volcano. Where he pours his drinks in. That's how yes. he drinks. And he, he loves B. Arthur. Did we mention B. Arthur was in it? B. Arthur is not only in it, Chuck, she sings a song. She does. She is the, uh, Which, unbeknownst to everyone, she manages or maybe owns she's the, the cantina. She's the owner. Yeah. The What's the Maz what? Maz Def Cantina? Uh, no, Maz Def is a rapper. Oh, yeah. I think you mean Maz Isley? Yes, yes, that cantina. <laughs> She's the owner. B. Arthur is the owner. B. Yeah. Arthur of the Golden Girls, but in this case, B. Arthur of Maud, because sure. as one of the people who wrote one of the articles we based this on points out, She's just basically playing Maud as the owner of the cantina. Yeah, and her song comes because um, they uh, basically say there's a lockdown, so you got to call Last Call mm-hmm. um, at your bar. So she calls Last Call by singing a song to everyone. Right, and again, we can't possibly have the script lead anywhere else but Chewbacca's house while his family waits for it. So all this takes place as part of a public service announcement, basically, yeah. broadcast by the Empire yeah. about how immoral <laughs> life on Tatooine is. Uh-huh. So let's go see what's going on in the Maz Eisley Cantina <laughs> as it's being shut down for curfew. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> all right, this is incomprehensible but uh it goes on um so they're in it there's also art carney yes he's, uh, of he's the honeymooners probably fame. the star of the whole thing really he has the you most think? lines i would say the most <laughs> comprehensible line <laughs> right yeah so he plays a uh, a traitor a human traitor um that is uh recently been with han solo and chewie and actually gets to kazook and says they're on the way it's all good yeah a trader not traitor yeah, a trader is in trades humans for, you know, money. No, he he sells goods. Yeah, a trader. He doesn't trade humans. Yeah, he's in the human trade. He, you, no, he isn't really? Yeah. He trades humans? Like he sells humans? It, I looked it up in the in Star Wars Encyclopedia. It said that he was in the human trade. Huh. So in this Christmas special... Yeah. Apparently, they sanitized his, his background because sure. he's basically just selling, like, gadgets and novelties and stuff like that to the Wookiees and the Empire uh, who were occupying the area. Yes. He comes bearing gifts. <clears throat> um, yeah, because he's a friend of Chewbacca's family. Yeah. So he comes bearing gifts. One of the gifts he gives is a uh, um, sort of like a little digital insert to a, oh, I guess you would call it a virtual reality hair dryer. Hair dryer, <laughs> like a, a beauty shop hair dryer. Right. He gives it to Grandpa Itchy. Grandpa Itchy um, sits under this hair dryer, pops in this uh, digital cassette, and it can only be described as 
softcore porn. Apparently, the writers who were interviewed for this said that was totally the intent. They were yeah. trying to get what amounted to softcore porn that would pass the censors. That's right. So it's all... <clears throat> I, you can't even say it's innuendo. It's too obvious and overt for innuendo. Instead, it's just, it's just, it's just gross. It's really gross. Um, Diane Carroll, great who, singer. Yes, she is um, a Vegas staple. Shows up and starts basically tantalizing um, Grandpa Itchy, who again, this is Chewbacca's elderly father, who now engages in some sort of. Well, he's, he's watching virtual reality pornography now. And this is a pretty lengthy segment in and of itself. Well, yeah, and she literally says to him, like, now I can see you're really excited. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's pretty rough to watch. Yeah, so then you've got another musical number. Because also, again, he, he shudders. Yeah. <laughs> it's really <laughs> strange. Uh, all right, so there's also a uh, – I know it seems like we're jumping around, but it's it's so no, mind-blowing. No, we're not. Like, this is pretty much like <laughs> blow for blow. Um, actually, I forgot earlier on in, in the in the special, um, there's one of my favorite sequences is when uh, Grandpa Itchy goes over to uh, Lumpy mm-hmm. and basically sets up – remember the, the hologram chessboard that they played in A New Hope? Yeah. Basically kind of sets that up and says, here, just play this. He pushes the button, which is clearly a 1970s cassette recorder, <laughs> <laughs> and another, uh, like, it's like a Cirque du Soleil uh, acid trip yeah. um, gymnast routine yeah. happens in front of the kid's eyes. Yeah. And again, this all just, it's not like it shows a snippet. They show the entire segments, like five, six, ten minutes <clears throat> long sure. of all of these things. So you would think, okay... They've gone to this hologram well a couple of times. Why not go to it again? Well, they do. They do. Uh To kill more time (laughs) while the Imperial Guard is ransacking their house. Um, Art Carney apparently, uh, I guess, is trying to get one of the Imperial Guard, the leader, I think, or one of the leaders. Who looks like somebody from Spaceballs, by the way. Very much so. Yeah. Um, And the writer of the Vanity Fair article, by the way, said... um, this this is so incomprehensible. The special is George Lucas didn't even have the Schwartz with him at the time. <laughs> so anyway, Art Carney's distracting this uh, I- uh, imperial leader um, while they're ransacking the Wookiee's house, Chewbacca's house, with a hologram. And this hologram, instead of being an acrobat or Diane Carroll or any kind of porn or anything like that, is Jefferson <laughs> Starship. <laughs> <laughs> and they decide that they're going to play Light the Sky on Fire, uh-huh. which apparently is about UFOs. It's a little music video, basically. It, it's a pre- Yeah, it's the predecessor to, like, um, Video Kill the Radio Star, you yeah. can tell. Um, and again, it is the whole lengthy song. Yeah. The whole thing. So every time that somebody's like, we need to escape mentally from what's going on here in our house, uh-huh. let's go into the video world... It's not just, and they don't cut back and forth. No. It's, okay, here's five minutes of Jefferson Starship performing this song. Yeah, and even the Jefferson Starship guys um, were like, yeah, it was sort of a weird trip. Like, we didn't get it, but we did it. Right. (laughs) They gave us some money and some cocaine. Well, probably so. So (laughs) we said, yeah. Chuck, I think, though, um, uh, yet another segment like this is actually widely regarded as the high point of the whole thing. Oh, sure. Agreed. So there is a cartoon, actually. Yeah, that uh, Lumpy. Lumpy watches. Yeah, Lumpy's like, uh, the Imperial Guard is still ransacking my house. <laughs> I think I'll entertain myself by watching a cartoon on my little, um, I don't iPad. know what it I guess it was an iPad. Yeah. And uh, he watches this cartoon, and it's it's actually remarkable for a number of reasons. It's the best part of the whole special. Yeah generally agreed upon as such, right. but not just us. And it introduces Boba Fett. It's the first time Boba Fett ever makes an appearance yeah. in the Star Wars universe. Yeah, it's actually not a bad, and you can't find it in the um, the one version I told you to watch. They removed it for copyright, but they you did. can watch a separate version. Right, you can find it on its own. Yeah, and it's um, it's very much reminiscent of like the cartoon style of the day, like a He-Man or something. For sure. Even, even, it's even a little more artsy than that. Yeah, but it does have a plot that you can follow that makes sense <laughs> right. as a Star Wars thing. Yeah. And it introduces Boba Fett, like you said, and um, it's actually not bad. Um, it's like Luke and R2 and C-3PO. Yeah. 
Then they're like they crash on a planet or something. Like yeah, that. and Han and Chewie are in it, and yeah, it's the right. first time we see in Darth Vader. Mm-hmm. It's the first time we see Boba Fett, and that he is. Uh, that he is just doing whatever he can do for money. Right. Like Luke trusts him at first. C-3PO is like, you sure you should trust him this quick? Yeah. And he's like, oh, 3PO, you and your non-trusting ways. Sure. And then it turns out he's selling them out to the dark side. So it's it's basically Boba Fett is an allegory for George Lucas himself. <laughs> um, so the cartoon comes and goes, and that was the thing that came at about the end of the first hour mark. And after that, everybody just turned off their television sets. Yeah, I don't remember. Did you watch this when it came on? Yeah, I remember watching it, but I don't remember much about it, like if I made it through it all. I mean, it was I was seven, and it was on till 10, so I probably didn't make it through it all. Yeah. Um, Plus, probably you're probably disturbed. Allowed. Who knows? I just remember that. I'll have to ask my brother. He might have a memory of this. I'll bet he does. I'm sure he met everybody afterward or something <laughs> like that. You know, has a picture. Well, he was 10 at that point, so cynicism had, you know, become a thing in his life probably. All right, by then? Sure. Didn't that when cynicism kicks in? I I can see Scott holding out to 14, 15. Yeah, maybe so. So, um, Chuck, the whole thing finally does end. And actually, there's a guy, uh, his name's Nathan Rabin. He he writes over at the AV Club. He had a great quote. He basically said that one of the great redeeming values of this um, this special is that it does eventually end. Yeah, you know what the first part of the quote is? (laughs) Uh, I'm not convinced the special wasn't ultimately written and directed by a sentient bag of cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, like, go read his his review of the Star Wars Holiday Special because he goes on to describe exactly what that must have been like, that yeah. development meeting where the bag of cocaine is pacing back and forth talking about what should happen. Right. That's what it feels like. <laughs> but, but it doesn't, and it ends even more. It takes this bizarre two hours and wraps it up in just a nice bizarre bow. Yeah, so what happens is eventually Han Solo, should we say spoiler alert? <laughs> uh, eventually Han Solo and Chewie make it to the planet. They park on the far side of the planet because they know the uh, the, the Imperial forces are there. And the exercise will do uh, Chewie good. Yeah, so they have to hike over there. They eventually make it back home. Uh, they find a storm, the stormtroopers at their house, right? Um, uh, their tree hut. Yeah, which way, by the way, high up. <laughs> The, the paintings that set this up, I don't think we mentioned. <laughs> I don't even call them matte paintings. They, it looks like someone painted something in, on the wall, and they just, like, put a camera in front of it. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So they get back, and um, uh, Chewbacca, uh, Han Solo hides around the corner. Chewbacca steps in front of his son uh-huh. to protect him. Sure. Han Solo jumps out, and the stormtrooper trips over a pile of logs and falls over the balcony. And dies in a holiday special. So they wouldn't even, ha- not only could he not shoot first with Greedo, but they uh, couldn't even have him, like, wrestle the stormtrooper and throw him off. He trips over a log. Right. Ha- and Han Solo <laughs> has his hands thrown up like, wasn't me. It might as well have been a banana peel, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. But, again, uh, this is basically produced by vaudevillians, starring vaudevillians. Why not have the one death take place from basically what amounts to somebody slipping on a banana peel. Exactly. It's a, it's a perfect way to end it. So that's uh, that, uh, that guy basically represents the end of the imperial threat for the rest of Life Day. Yeah. And um, we, we then see Life Day being celebrated, which is celebrated by lots of Wookiees assembling in what looks like a giant Olin Mills portrait. Yeah. Um, and all of them are wearing red robes. Sure. And I know I'm up talking, and it's because my <laughs> mind is still having trouble like uh-huh. wrapping around this. Oh, yeah. And then um, Princess Leia comes out with C-3PO. Mm-hmm. Uh, is Mark Hamill there? Uh, the whole gang's there, if I'm okay, not mistaken. Okay, the whole gang's there. And then they all gather around to hear a great quote from Princess Leia, which we will read um, verbatim. This holiday is yours, but we all share with you the hope that this day brings us closer to freedom and to harmony and to peace. No matter how different we appear, we're all the same in our struggle against the powers of evil and darkness. I hope that this day will always be a day of joy in which we can reconfirm our dedication and our courage and more than anything else, our love for one another. This is the promise of the Tree of Life. Mm. Cue song. Right. And we should also point out, the Tree of Life has never been mentioned up to this point. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea what that just was. It makes a sudden appearance <laughs> at the end. And when you said Cue Song, by Cue Song you mean Princess Leia starts singing. Yeah, and apparently that was one of the big 
contingencies on Carrie Fisher being yeah. involved. Yeah. She's going through a phase where she's like, I kind of like singing. Bruce Valanche calls it her Joni Mitchell period. <laughs> yeah, and she somehow convinced them to let her sing as Princess Leia. And she does. And again, uh, I've said that she looks like she's on drugs. This is the point where she really does look like she's on drugs. And it's not just me. Um, other writers who've written reviews of this, it's really obvious that she <laughs> possibly smoked a decent amount of pot before <laughs> she shot this shot this scene. But she sings, okay, it's fine. It's just the, the fact that um, Princess Leia is singing. And actually, Bruce Valanche had a really great quote, too. He says that um, she very much wanted to show this side of her talent. And there was general dismay because this was not what we wanted Princess Leia to be doing. Yeah. She did it anyway. So the whole thing ends with her singing this song about Life Day. Oh, yeah. Which is set r- loosely to the John Williams Star Wars theme. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so along the way, the director, original director quit. Uh, a new director, Steve Binder, was hired to finish the job and bring it in. Uh, and he did. Over the original $1 million budget, of course, always. Uh, he did bring it in, and um, at this point, uh, George Lucas had uh, he was he was working on Empire Strikes Back. He didn't know what was going on. He wasn't around for the shoot. No, it wasn't until it aired, I think, that he actually saw it. Yes, and it was a travesty, obviously, <laughs> uh, if you haven't noticed that by now. Uh, critics hated it. Uh, Star Wars fans really hated it. Everybody, hated, the people who were in it, hated it. Lucas hated it. Um, even Harvey Corman secretly hated it. Yeah, even Harvey Keitel hated it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, he loved it. But uh, Lucas has been asked over the years about it a lot, and he doesn't talk about it much. Uh, but in 2005, and I don't buy this for a second, he says um, it was an interview. He said, oh, yeah. the special from 1978 uh, really didn't have much to do with us, you know. That part is true. Uh, I can't remember what network it was even on, but uh, it was a thing that they did. That's a lie. There's no way he doesn't know that was CBS. Yeah. Uh, we kind of just let them do it. I believe that. Uh, it was done by, I can't even remember who the group was, but they were variety TV guys. I'm sure he remembers a few of them. <laughs> uh, we let them use the characters and stuff, and that probably wasn't the smartest thing to do, but you learn from those experiences. Yeah. I think they even use some of the footage from the movie. At the end. It looks like some of the <clears throat> space stuff. It's like a highlight reel of yeah. the gang. Well, and during the... Um, it looked like some of the they had some insert shots of like uh, Imperial cruisers and Tie fighters and stuff. That yeah, and like, like it was from and the movie. remember when uh, when Chewbacca like leans back and puts his hands behind his yeah, head? Yeah, yeah, that's in there. It's it's like a just a highlight reel from the movie, saying like, yeah. if you like this, go see the movie. Well, and also that means it doesn't match the look of the rest of it at all. Yeah, that's true. It's just sort of inserted. They in there. tried. They yeah. definitely tried. <laughs> Um, and George Lucas is totally full of it because in 1987, he told Starlog magazine that the Christmas special would be out on video cassette very soon. Yes. And in 2007, two years after that quote you just read where he's like, I don't even know what you're talking about, basically. Um, he apparently uh, considered releasing the Christmas special as a bonus on the, um, the DVDs of the first three. Right, but did not. Didn't. And apparently Carrie Fisher told Lucas that if you want me to do um, DVD extras. Commentary. Yeah, commentary, then I want a, a clean original copy of the holiday special. Yes. So why? You go ahead. So I can play at parties when I want people to leave. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty great. It is. So, uh, and there is one of those clean copies is floating around out there. So you can watch this in, it, in its entirety. Some of it. Like the cartoon was removed due to copyright infringement and that kind of stuff. But as as the case with the rest of the internet, you can just go find it elsewhere and, and piece it together. There's also the original ads that aired in Baltimore. Yeah. That are just fascinating. Yeah, those are always fun. GM ads uh-huh. where one of the guys who's in quality control is, he says, did you watch it? Uh, I don't think I saw that one. He goes, um, we really care about these cars. That's no jive, man. <laughs> On a GM ad, and he's, like, dead serious. Oh, they were trying to be hip. Yeah. um, It's uh, pretty good stuff. uh, Here's my final thought on it. I love it. It does not taint my Star Wars experience or my love for the franchise. Okay. And I'm glad it is out there because it's a a fun little stain that shouldn't be taken too seriously. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it adds to it, actually, because it's campy and awful. Yeah. And I don't know, somehow that enriches the rest of it. 
I'm with you. You like it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I watched it twice. I wouldn't have watched it a second. I wouldn't have made it through the first time. I, I, let me take that back. I, as I'm a pro, yeah. so I would have made it through the first <laughs> time. I wouldn't have watched it a second time if I wasn't. there wasn't something about it. And I figured out I think the thing that I like the most about it is Lumpy, Chewbacca's son, yeah. played by uh, an actress named Patty Maloney, uh-huh. who frankly is hands down the best actor in the entire thing. <laughs> she, like her responses and everything, yeah. is just awesome. I think my favorite parts are, uh, well, there's a great Wilhelm scream. Yes, I noticed that too. When the stormtrooper trips over the log. Jerry would not have noticed it. Uh, and then there's a part where all the Wookiee dialogue you can't understand, but there's clearly one part where where Itchy and Lumpy are having an exchange where Lumpy, you can make it out, goes, I love you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that as but well. But it's covered up, but uh, someone was like, we have to have at least one exchange where you sort of know what they're saying. Sure. Or they were like, I think she just said, I love you. Should we have them redo it? And the director's <laughs> like, no, I want to go. And Chuck, there's one other thing that I figured out from watching this. What's that? It's not readily apparent. The whole thing is made all the more odd and that there's situation after situation after situation where we, as normal audiences, were trained to expect a laugh track, but there's oh, not yeah. a laugh track. Yeah, Had I didn't there been that. a laugh track, yeah. it, w- it might have been less bizarre yeah but the fact that it's missing just makes your it agitates the mind so it's this whole additional element that it is weird i never thought about that there's just weird moments of silence all throughout it yeah like when art carney's doing his thing yeah, yeah. telling jokes yeah uh okay i agree with you chuck don't take things too seriously i think that's the great lesson in this yeah and then uh, that's two- the lesson of life day <laughs> it is and in 2007 uh riff tracks the oh, great yeah. uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 guys, Mike Nelson, Bill Corbett, and Kevin Murphy, uh, provided audio commentary for the full version of the special. So uh, try and go grab that if you can as well. Oh, you can. It's on their site. Because it's great. I think it's like eight bucks. And those guys are awesome. And um, They are. At least uh, I think Corbett listens to us. So hey, Corbett. <laughs> you got anything else? No. No, I think we did this. There's some good stuff. Go read the Vanity Fair article, uh, Han Solo Comedy Hour. There's a book called How Star Wars Conquered the Universe that has a very interesting chapter about this. That's where we found it asserted that George Lucas never said that he would smash this thing with a sledgehammer. Right. Um, and there's also an entire website dedicated to it, StarWarsHolidaySpecial.com. Yeah. And uh, if you want to know more about the Star Wars Holiday Special, we have a ton of har- uh, Star Wars stuff on How Stuff Works, by the way. Yeah, we have cool um, sort of fun articles about the Death Star and lightsabers. Videos and with uh, Holly Fry from stuff uh, you missed in history class. Yeah, who she knows her stuff. She does. Um, so you can just type Star Wars in the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com, and it'll bring up some cool stuff for you. Since I said search bar, it's time for listener mail. Uh, hey, guys. Just finished listening to the Voynich Manuscript Podcast. Found it super interesting especially the theories on its definition or origin. Uh, I know Josh mentioned Chuck's theory of it being drug-induced is somewhat surprising or even unlikely given the language in the manuscript follows linguistic laws, uh, only founded in the past 100 years. But if you think about it, it's it's tough to stray away from familiar structures, especially for something like language. I think back to when I was younger and friends invented their own languages or even in writing a song or poetry, creativity can sometimes be limited by what we know. Uh... So just thought I'd contribute that to the conversation. Nice, thanks. Uh, big thanks for all you guys do. I found the podcast after moving to San Diego in the last few years for some noise uh, around my apartment. So basically we were blocking out noise. We do that. Which I love. Uh, and then as a way to get through traffic on my commute home from work, you guys are far more interesting and enjoyable than television and YouTube videos. I'm sure I've listened to hundreds and will continue to listen to hundreds more. Keep on keeping on. That is from Amy J. Moffat. Thanks a lot, Amy, in San Diego. Doesn't that mean like Place of the Whales in German or something like that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. If you want to get in touch with us, you can tweet to us at SYSK Podcast. You can join us on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know. You can send us an email to Stuff Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, StuffYouShouldKnow.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.